Previously on Handbook for Mortals. Alright, tell me cards, which boy should I choose? Hey, hey, listen! Hey, listen! Hey, uh, listen, listen! Go away! Hey, listen. We open in italics vision! Around the main stage with Sherry's harem along with the actual plain white tees. Drew makes a triumphant comeback from his initial appearance in Chapter 5, something I honestly never thought would happen. Drew is described as a decent guy who got along with everyone. Hmm. Such a vague description like this one is giving me a real case of deja vu. And surprise, surprise! Taz is also described as one who worked well with everyone, not to mention Sherry herself yearns to get along with everyone. I admit, it's on the pedantic side to poke at this simplistic repetition that doesn't ever appear again in the same context, yet Sherem seems to hold so much stock for this rudimentary character trait that to see it repeated three times like this, it's hard for me not to notice it. Anywho... I have a better idea on what Drew looks like now, which is more than I could say for Beth or Maggie or Human Mel or Sophia or the Mysterious Girl. I will die on this hill, I swear to God. But I also want to note that Sherry goes out of her way to roast Drew's pathetically average existence to us, cementing him as the only sympathetic male character in my eyes. Like everyone f***ing on Drew. It's kind of sad. Meanwhile, uh, Plain White teases Tom Higginson requests permission from Drew to have an extra rehearsal tomorrow. Oh, oh, no, I'm sorry. I mean, demand, but in a way that doesn't sound demanding. But in a way that doesn't sound demanding. Then, Plain White teases Damar Hamilton comments on getting a new drum kit with DW finally coming through. What? I... I don't know what that stands for. I never find out though, as Drew turns to Mac for the approval and they get that extra hour for rehearsal and all's well. Yippee! Mac also informs Drew that Sophia's been getting shots by her handheld mic and then asks if he knows anything about it. All right, here's another specified instance of tech misbehaving. Probably not going to lead to anything, but nonetheless, the foreshadowing is duly noted. Drew frowns and responds with, Man, there ain't nothing wrong with her mic. I'm sure she just wants more attention. Or another new mic. Oh, piss off! Mac grimaces. Probably both, he says. Bite me! But he wants to check it out anyway. Way to save the shred of professionalism there, Mac the character who supposedly prides himself on stage safety. Drew points to where the mic case is and angles his finger in the direction of Sophie's, says it's in the case with her name on it. Mac proceeds to where the mic case sits and locates the one labeled Sophia. I hope that was as exhausting for you to hear as it was for me to read. Though on the other hand, I just really appreciate this book explicitly clarifying the exact location of Sophia's mic and how Mac goes to said exact location that's properly labeled for us big galaxy-brained geniuses. Props. Mac's fiddling around when all of a sudden a wild Sherry appears. All she does is walk by the gaggle of men to the main stage and they all stop in their tracks to gaze in awe of their supreme goddess gliding on by. And she never even stops to take notice to any of them. No, like, hey guys, no, nothing. She just whooshes on by. And they're all like, oh. You know, Sarum, just because I know what you're doing with the pheromone shtick doesn't mean I have to like it. Ever since the mystery girl told us the effects of Sherry's um, magic pheromones or whatever, the book's really driving the point home now. I feel like Sarum's trying to redirect our attention from the self-indulgent overkill in order to assure us that there's a genuine reason for all the men to fawn over her unsuspecting butts. It's all intentional, y'all. I promise. Ugh. Anyway... Our ace MacGyver tinkers away with Sophia's mic by 
turning it and shaking it. <sighs> so impressive. A true jack of all trades, master of none. Drew approaches Mac and gushes over Sherry's unique beauty, unwittingly poking the bear, if you will. But Mac internally gushes to us how much he enjoys spending time with Sherry, never seeming to tire of her and always missing her when she's not around. Yeah, alright, sure, whatever. Unless I see more of the supposed chemistry for myself, I'm just gonna attribute this to the pheromones. Which might as well be heroin at this point. It just makes more sense. If I close my eyes, I can see the analysis essay titles now. Handbook for Mortals. An Allegory on Drug Addiction. Mac continues on, telling us that Sherry and him have an unspoken rule to keep their off-the-clock trysts on the down-low. So they tiptoe around, steal secret glances and smiles. Like they're legit having a scandalous affair. And they think they're being so low-key about it. Drew flexes his expertise on the female gender, knowing just when a woman likes a man. He's meticulously studied the mystery method cover to cover, you know. With this foolproof knowledge, he hopes he has a shot with Sherry. Max growing increasingly uncomfortable and tries to end the rather awkward conversation by telling Drew that he's probably not her type. Jackson's observing all this from the sidelines, amused by the sight of Max floundering. Oh ho! Is Jackson scheming over here? I can dig a scheming Jackson. Gives him more character. Gives him a character. Oh, Lord, I hope he's revealed to actually be some kind of chaotic trickstery force. That's the only way I can like this guy. Just steer right into that psychopathic skid there, buddy. Tad intervenes with the intent of diffusing the growing tension, but it fails miserably as Cam jumps in to neg on poor Drew. Then Riley cartwheels onto the scene to defend him. Finally, Jackson pitches in so he doesn't feel left out. Good fucking job there, Tad. Mac tries to redirect attention by mentioning that Jackson already asked Sherry out, while gauging how far his rival's gotten with her. <laughs> See, he's gotta go through Jackson, cause he feels that if he actually asks Sherry, she'll turn into a conversation of defining their relationship. <laughs> no, she wouldn't! <laughs> We all know for a fact she wouldn't. The act of her stringing these two guys along for many months is proof of such. Hell, if this book has one undeniable truth, it's that Sherry can be as indecisive as Chidi Anagonye. Plus, Max screws his past girlfriend once and believed they were dating from there on Kent is just as afraid of any official commitment as Sherry. Therefore, everything remains as it should be. A stagnant fart. Jackson responds with, and I quote, Yeah, I've been testing the waters a little. I definitely go swimming in that ocean. That's right, Jackson just compared Sherry's gaping vagina to a vast body of water. Granted, that's more romantic than anything E.L. James could ever write. So, silver linings. Max actually worried that Jackson already did scuba dive down into Sherry's immense depths. But Jackson alleviates Max's concerns, saying, She's the kind of girl you want to marry, not just used to get laid. Hmm, surely Sarum isn't projecting here. Nah, of course not. Jackson continues, saying he's not sure he's ready to give up his freedom just yet. But she's certainly the person to do it for! Mac even agrees with Jackson's notion enough to repeat it for us. Sherry was the kind of girl you marry. Yep, certainly not projecting at all. Jackson notices Mac go into a daze. His mental gerbil sprints into motion. So he baits Mac. Five years from now, wild horses couldn't keep me away. Maybe sooner, he added in part to see what reaction he might get. Well! Dump my boyfriend and call me Taylor. There's a snake in my boot! Damn! I gotta admit, I like Jackson a whole lot more when Sherry is not around. The mask slips and we see him for how he really is. I am here for actual psychopathic asshole Jackson. Hiss. 
Mac gets annoyed and ends the conversation by getting everyone back to work, mentioning that the doors open in 20 minutes. The book decides to hit the brakes for Plain White teases Tom to make a comment. You know, I always feel like there's some joke there. Mac's like, what? You know that doors being a saying about opening the doors to let patrons come in to see the show, and the fact that the theater also gets called The House. And there's a band called The Doors, and Max shook his head. And you live in a van down by the river? Kid, I have no idea what you are talking about. Yeah, I know. Like I said, I haven't figured it out yet. But there is a joke there. <laughs> okay, well, let us know if you ever find it. Tad chuckled and walked away. The book taps the gas pedal again when the crowd finally disperses. But Jackson's still lingering about. He goes in for a final blow and questions Mac if he'll ask Sherry out. After all, she's fair game and he likes a gentleman's challenge, with the fair maiden being the grand prize. All's fair in love and war. Oh ho 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 Mac first tries to deflect by suggesting Drew as a better love rival, to which Jackson promptly curb stomps the absolute asinine possibility that such a mediocre existence could ever compete with him. Mac tries to reassert his rule on not dating performers and how Sherry isn't even his type. Tad, uh, I mean, Jackson promptly calls out Mac's BS. Oh my god, why have Jackson here if he's just gonna reiterate the same spiel as Tad? This is the first time we even see Jackson and Mac alone together. And sure, they immediately fail the reverse Bechtel test in record time. Congrats to them, the plaque will be delivered next week. Guess I'm disappointed it's just the same recycled conversation, along with the actual line, all's fair in love and war. Twice! My eyes had to see that in a semi-serious context. Twice! Come on! Do better! There's a double space scene break as we cut to Mac and Tad getting food in the employee dining room, otherwise known as the EDR, for those lucky enough to forget the first time it's been explained to us. They fill their plates to the brim and sit off in the far corner so they can spill the tea pitcher in peace. They're discussing the police investigation from Sophia's fall, along with the ongoing technical malfunctions and how they can improve going forward. Uh, who am I kidding? They're talking about Sherry. Like those two would actually be discussing work-related topics. One can only dream. In between stuffing their faces, Mac confesses all his vanilla activities with Sherry to Tad. He scolds Mac to do a better job at hiding it because they weren't as stealthy as they thought. Tad also informs him that the evil harpy Sophia is already circulating the anti-Sherry rumor mill. She's super salty some dumb hick newbie popped out of nowhere and kicked her out of the star spot on the billboard. And really, can you blame her? This is too unrealistically self-indulgent even for Sherum. We've still seen jack shit from this show. For all we know, Sherry's high dive is her only act. Like, now I'm questioning the quality of this whole shoe to begin with if that's the highlight. Tad confirms that Sophia really hates Sherry. And really, don't we all? Max, like, God, that ungrateful girl should be nicer to her savior. And Tad literally says, <laughs> that actually requires Sophia to act like a human being. To which Mac verbatim replies, Yeah, well, one could always hope. <laughs> End of chapter. This sucked. It's just 85% Sherry worship, 15% Sophia bashing. So, same old, same old? Except this time, Sherry only has that one cameo appearance, yet her presence is still all-encompassing. Except for that one brief moment when Plain White teases Tom brings up his whole door shtick. So far, that is the one time in this entire book where the other men aren't fawning over Sherry, slamming on Sophia, or discussing any other dating-related topics. Just some dudes trying way too hard to have an organic conversation over some random shit. Sure, it felt entirely out of left field with it sandwiched in between Sherry gushing, but I will take note of the pyrite when I see a glimmer in front of me. <sighs> Bliss can be ever so fleeting.
Why, hello there. So nice of you to drop by. If you'll please become utterly entranced by this crudely drawn hip swiveling, I'd like to deliver my ending spiel. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you all for watching. If you like what you see, and how can you not look at these hips go? Please consider supporting me on my Patreon, where you can get one day early access to all upcoming videos, as well as the entire uncut audio of book reviews. You can hear me yap for almost double the amount of time! You can also vote for the next novel for me to suffer through, or enjoy. I'm at y'all's mercy after all. I can even draw sketches for you at child labor prices! Oh! I jest, I jest. Kinda. If you're unable to support me on a subscription basis via Patreon, and I totally understand. I also have a Kofi page tip jar for your instant generosity needs. You do you, boo. No judgment. Finally, a like and subscribe still goes a long way. I'm eternally grateful for any and all support. You may now peel your eyes away from this sexy, sexy penguin body. Remember to stay hydrated, friends, and take care.